And moving on to our second speaker, um, it's very good that the committee is able to bring people to this meeting who are not just national experts across Canada, but indeed are internationally recognized for their experience. And our next speaker, um, together with his network team, has uh, made and documented interventions that have undoubtedly helped uh, reduce mortality and morbidity for countless ladies across the world. So Dr. Sam Su um, received his MD at the University of Alberta and underwent postgraduate training at the Mayo Clinic and at the Harvard Teaching Hospitals. He holds master's degrees in epidemiology and also in business administration. His program in maternal cardiology has been supported um, by grants from uh, this organization, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and also by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. Dr. Shu is the recipient of the Ivy Business School Scholar Award, uh, Western, and at the, university, uh, the Western University Department of Medicine Research Award and Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry's Dean's Award for Research Excellence. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Shu to give his presentation entitled Heart Disease and Pregnancy, uh, the top three things you need to know. Sam, thank you, Dave. Thank you, David, for that very kind introdu introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, and thank you for the program committee for this kind introduction to, sh to share what we have learned over the years uh, with you. Okay, clicker. Moment of truth. <laughs> um, I have no disclosures, and uh, we will do our best to mitigate bias. This is an area where uh, there's a lot of folklore, and when I started out at Toronto General 23 years ago as a junior staff, this was part of my Clinepi project coming back to Toronto from Boston. And what happened was that my thesis advisor said, Sammy, you know, before you do this big prospective study, why don't you do a little case series and retrospective chart review before you waste somebody else's time? You just waste your own. And that's what I did, and that le and that led to a bit of a hobby and a lot of, a long journey through the years, and it has been very exciting because it sort of gives me uh, something else uh, to sort of focus on in 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 complement to what I do in everyday life, which is general cardiology and echocardiography. These are the learning objectives. And what I'm not trying to impart or share with you over the next 20 minutes is not necessarily the nitty gritty of this uh, field, but to give you some sort of template and a comfort zone that says this is not all sort of, I call it folklore or black magic. There is some data behind it, but it is an, a special population uh, and women with pre-existing heart disease comprise in large obstetric hospital about 0.5% of the population. You can say, well, that's less than 1%. Do I really care? Well, if you take a hospital like the Mount Sinai down the street here with a volume of 7,000 deliveries a year, or London Health Science Center, number two, where, I work, where I'm working now, at about five to 6,000, and you take 0 0.5 of that, that is not an inconsequential number. And even the general cardiologist may not see some of these patients, but every two or three years, they may see one. They may see the sickest one. So uh, it's good to have some sort of approach because otherwise you sort of get the, uh, the lowest common denominator is straight shoot from the hip and base your practice on your, bad, your last bad case series, right? And as you know, uh, judgment comes from experience, and experience sometimes comes from bad judgment. So, you know. So we learn, we learn as we go. Now, this is a graph showing on the x-axis time, and on the y-axis, the top curve is basically the cardiac output. So as we all know, pregnancy is a state where there's increased salt and water retention, increased red cell mass, and so the cardiac output goes up almost at the, as soon as conception occurs, and it peaks around the third trimester. And so this is a physiologic hyperdynamic state. And it's polyrhythmic, and is the metabolic uh, parameters goes wonky, so you can tell by the cholesterol, and it's an inflammatory state. I used to joke at my patients when I looked at, talked to the fathers, the partners, I said, now you know why Mother's Day is such a special event, okay? Now, at the time of labor and delivery, there's further uh, fluctuations in cardiac output, which is only blunted by the presence of regional anesthesia. 
and immediately post delivery is a danger period because that's when the uterus is empty, is no longer pressing on the inferior vena cava, and you can get uh, reflex bradycardia and a redistribution pulmonary edema. Our house staff sees it because they got called in the middle of the night, usually from the postpartum floor when somebody's flooding. Now, normal pregnancy is accompanied by all sorts of changes in the cardiovascular system and in the pulmonary system. So these are symptoms of dyspnea, syncope, palpitations, or fog, they all can be part of a normal pregnancy. And on exam, they have a prominent JVP. The JVP is not up, but the waveforms are accentuated. Apex can be displaced, and almost every woman past about 26 weeks will have some sort of low uh, intensity flow murmur across the pulmonic valve. ECG can have all sorts of funny abnormalities that can fake out the unsuspected pr practitioner, uh, usually our junior health staff. You can have right and left QRS uh, deviation. You have all sorts of STT changes that the computer will start reading as ischemia. So don't panic. Sinus tachycardia, uh, non-sustained arrhythmia, and even sustained SVT have been reported in normal pregnancy. Chest X-ray, straightening of the left upper up cardiac border. This is a, this is, these are features you can spend an hour on. So if you have no data, you can spend a whole hour talking about this, but we won't today, okay? Uh, echo shows usually an increase in dimensions, and the, and the echo dimensions of a normal uh, pregnancy in the left atrium and the left ventricle overlaps that of the mildly abnormal range. So be careful, those of us who read echoes, that you don't overcall organic heart disease. So takeaway point number one, you get physiologic state of hyperdynamic state, and it sort of messes up your cardiac evaluation and mimics heart disease. Okay, what do we do when somebody walks in and say, I have this condition, or someone sends somebody to you, or you see somebody in the hospital? I'm a simple guy. I like to keep things simple, because as, as one of some to someone told me, rote memory is the last refuge of the desperate. Okay, so you don't want to be rote memorized. So I say five things. What's the risk of the mom? What is the risk of the baby? And those parents with congenital heart disease, either the father or the mother, what's the recurrence risk? What do I do now until the time that the patient is delivering? And what do I do afterwards? So predicting maternal risk usually rests on a good history of physical exam oximetry, a 12-week ECG, and the comprehensive transthoracic echo. These are facilities and technology that, that's, that's available to most practitioners in the developed world. So you often do not have the uh, luxury of preconception counseling where somebody says, well, Dr. Smith, I want to get pregnant next year. What do you think? Most of the time, they say, I'm 20 weeks. I'm here. Look after me. So that's the reality. Or the ones that are very high risk knows that if they show up after 24, 25 weeks, they're viable, and you cannot advise uh, uh, termination, okay? So the, 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 your patients are very well informed, and it will do exactly what they want to do, sometimes contrary to your medical advice, and that's the reality. Now, these are the high-risk heart lesions, which gives me chest pain. Marfan syndrome with dilated aorta, Eisenmenger syndrome. These are patients with left to right shunts who have now develop severe pulmonary hypertension and are now shunting right to left and they are blue. Mechanical valve, okay? Periparmic cardiomyopathy that haven't recovered the left ventricular systolic ejection fraction. Somebody with a heart attack or acute coronary syndrome during pregnancy. This gives me chest pain, okay? So these are the things that when you see them, you run. You send them to somebody else who knows what they're doing, okay? Divest yourself because no, nothing good will come with this if you try to hang on to this patient. Okay, and those of us who get to look after this patient, well, it is what it is. Okay, this is a car break study that my colleague and I from all across Canada, a bunch of clinicians, these are not hotshot clinical scientists, not funded by a big pharma or big device company. We've applied for an MRC grant. We did a four year study, collect every patient going through the uh, congenital or maternal cardiac service from Vancouver to Halifax, and we came up with the first multi center prospective outcome study called CARPRICT. And what it does is, uh, too sensitive, what it does is it basically put together four factors equal weight and gives you a mild, intermediate, and high risk of cardiac complications and heart disease. The Dutch and the Belgians 
felt that they should put more uh, lesion-specific risk into it, and they said HERO1, and they replicated some of our work. Now they have, in the retrospective study, they were able to combine more patients, so they have twice as many patients, but many of the data are uh, identical, the findings are identical to heartbreak, and they have a few more factors. Now this is published in 2010. As you remember, internet was sort of became usable in 1995, and I think smartphone was showing its face around that time. So these index are hard to calculate. You have to go to a calculator. There wasn't any sort of uh, app or anything like that. And it never really took off, mainly because it was hard to calculate. And most of us are, we, we got somebody in front of me at the bedside. We have to make a decision. We can't say, well, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to go to the next room and look up at my computer. Okay. One, it looks, makes you look bad, okay? Number two, it wastes time. So this never took off. And so they put everything together, Carpreg, Sahara 1, and WHO, they had a modified WHO classification. This is from the European Society of Cardiology in 2011. And it's an expert panel, okay? So an expert panel is only as good as the expert that you put into it. And sometimes when there's no randomized clinical data, which is like what happens in pregnancy heart disease, not even good observational data, it becomes a battle of who can speak the most articulate fashion and who can speak the loudest and the longest. So sometimes you have to be suspect of the so-called expert consensus. But first principle, they sort of put everything but into somebody with a very low risk and very high risk. This is on your handout. Don't expect to memorize them, but it sort of gives you a, a sense of the gradient of risk. So the lowest risk of things that you don't really need to be a cardiologist to realize that somebody with just isolated premature top is going to be very low risk. Their, their risk is negligible. And on the other hand, when you go up, class two to class three, three is the mechanical valve, okay? Uh, that, the one that gives me chest pain. And, and other variants of cyanotic heart disease unrepaired. And the class four are overlaps of what I call the high-risk lesion. These are the pulmonary arterial hypertension, bad systemic uh, left ventricle function, peripyramid amorphy, uh, severe mitral stenosis, or severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. Now, you can say they're all high risk. Do they, all, do they have all equal risks? That's debatable, and that's never that when they published the, the index, this uh, classification, it was not, uh, they did not validate it. And, the uh, multi-center study have tried to validate it, and I can tell you that not all lesions in that, this category is the same risk. We have been quietly collecting our data through the years and listening to all this back and forth, and so uh, last month for the American Heart, it was our pleasure to uh, present for the first time our ongoing prospective registry, registry which builds on the CARB project. This is un in review uh, in one of the uh, cardiology journal, so this is all I can share with you. Showing that with a new risk score, the CARPREG2 risk score, based on 2,000 consecutive pregnancies in Vancouver and Toronto, Mount Sinai, that we have a new index that sort of separates people into zero to one to greater than four points, that spreads out the risk and which the uh, predicted risk uh, correspond very good to the validation set. The validation set is one third of these 2,000, is randomly chosen. We don't uh, analyze any of the data in validation set. The validation set is, her, is the fountain of uh, truth, so to speak. And we're able to come up with not only the four predictors that we identify with some modifications, but also six other predictors, because the overall event rate is 16 percent, mortality rate was 0 0.5. We had six deaths, fortunately. So mostly morbid event, mostly arrhythmia, sustaining arrhythmia requiring treatment, and heart failure. Now you say, well, do I really care about arrhythmia? No one died. Well, arrhythmia has been associated with uh, premature uh, uh, onset of labor. Arrhythmia can trigger heart failure. Arrhythmia can sustain arrhythmia, that is, can also uh, re uh, increase the risk of fetal neonatal complications. And one of the last category on the bottom is the late pregnancy assessment. And that shows that something about the process of care may also influence the risk. So getting back to you about patients not showing up on time. So one of the take home points is that you need to get these patients into the specialized centers when you diagnose them. Don't wait till the second or third trimester. Uh, so the four classifications are prior cardiac events or arrhythmia, baseline near functional class three or four, or cyanosis. You can say, why do you lump cyanosis with bad functional class? It's because when you're cyanotic, 
your oxygen saturation is less than 90, by definition, you're impaired on a functional level. Mechanical valve, we talked about, and any sort of ventricular systolic dysfunction, high-risk valve disease, we classify as moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, or the presence of mild to moderate aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis. Pulmonary hypertension, we define coronary artery disease, high-risk aerotopathy or things like low deeds, dilated aortic roots and marfans, et cetera, and the absence of cardiac intervention. Now, so that's the risk to the mother. We spent a lot of time on that. What about the risk to the baby? Uh, we did a nested study from a Toronto study where we recruited about 500 uh, pregnant women prospectively from the same free hospital that was also recruiting heart disease women. So same obstetrical standard of care, same obstetricians. And so there's no variability. And so that when you compare those with heart disease and those without heart disease, the chance of having a fetal neonatal complication is almost three to one. And that's been bare out from our series. We did this so-called propensity adjusted uh, odds ratio, which shows 2.6, clearly highly significant. So takeaway point number two is, you know, you have a choice of risk stratification approaches for predicting risk. You can use whatever ones that you're comfortable with. Maybe the WHO class works better because you don't have to look at the number. Maybe you want to try the carpet two once it gets published. We're going to try to uh, develop a risk calculator for this because, again, it's not all weighted equally. And an important concept I've learned painfully through the years from personal experience is that you cannot take an overall all cavalier approach even to the low-risk patients. So low cardiac risk in various series, whether in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere, carries with it about 5%. So that's 1 in 20. 1 in 20 is not zero, okay? So uh, I've been burnt by this many times, okay? Less now because now I finally learned the lesson painfully. So remember, sometimes experience comes from bad judgment. You're looking at a guy, okay? Elevated fetal neural rate risk, I just show you on that slide. So what do you do? Uh, just at a very uh, general approach, and I'm going to talk about some specific issues of, you know, you're covering, you're on call, you're covering these patients, you're covering for a partner, and this patient just show up, what do you do? So general approach is that get them to, to a center where they some have some expertise in pregnancy and maternal heart disease, not someone who might see one of these two patients in their practice every year, but a specialized center. We have su such centers at Toronto, Mount Sinai Hospital. We have one in London. Uh, there are groups of uh, practitioners or experts in Ottawa, in Kingston, and in Hamilton. So every major sort of obstetric center uh, that has also has cardiac centers have those individuals. And so you can find one. If you can't find one, send me an email. I'll, I'll send you to the right people. Uh, and this is not a heroic thing where it's one person becomes a huge ego trip to I know everything. This, we work in teams. And the strength of the team is that everyone brings the expertise and it complements each other. So the team includes obstetrics, cardiology, perinatology, nursing, social work, because there's a lot of layers to this onion, not just the pregnancy, no, not just the pregnant women with the underlying heart disease. Best to refer before conception if it is possible. There are studies showing that it is benefit to have preconception counseling. And if not possible, when so as soon as they're diagnosed, refer them on. And we talk to a maternal cardiology clinic. This is a survey that Dr. Kovacs, when uh, she was at Toronto Congenital Cardiac Center for Adults, uh, uh, pioneered and led uh, uh, with our support, showing that not all patients who would recall being told of increased risk. So the uh, top layer, the top two cells, are patients recall being told of increased risk? No. Uh, 27 out of the 43 patients, small sample, these are psychological surveys, very detailed. 27 out of the 43 really were intermediate to high risk. The ones who were told that they were told they were high risk, 20 of them of the 73 were low risk. So sometimes scaring people and over reassuring people can be equally detrimental. What are the interventions to reduce risk? Smoking cessation has nothing to do with cardiology. It reduces risk to the, to, of a bad fetal neonatal outcome, such as intrauterine growth, growth retardation, spontaneous uh, onset of premature labor, et cetera. Correction of cyanosis, treatment of sacral lesions, 
usually by the time they get to my neck of the woods, everything that can be done have been done. So if there's somebody still there, they're still blue, they still have complex congenital heart disease, someone, they've had many kicks at the can, and someone's have done all they can. And so you can, you can ask that question intellectually, but the practical answer is that you, you, this is the deck of cards that you have been dealt, and you will go with it. And department management, and we, we do uh, emphasize with those that intimate the high risk of multidisciplinary approach. As a cardiologist, I will see them as soon as I, at the time of referral, and again, at least during the third trimester. Those that are very high risk will need uh, um, a greater intensity of follow up and perhaps repeat echocardiography. We do fetal echo at, for, at about 18 to 20 weeks gestation, and that excludes most of the bad serious uh, congenital heart disease. But we, also, but we also realize that there are minor lesions like obviously an atrial septal defect, a ventricular septal defect by cuspid aircraft that will not be picked up by fetal echo. It's simply beyond the resolution of the instrument. Cardiac medication is important. We can spend a whole hour on anticoagulations. There's just different schools of thoughts. And again, there are no right answers. Uh, Peripartum management. There's, in some patients at low risk, we have no issues about delivering at the local uh, hospital, local community hospital, as long as their physicians and obstetricians and midwives there are comfortable. What you don't want to do is have everybody be on board and then one person, the person is on call who's not being aware of this going on, that person is on call and your patient shows up and that patient goes, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this, and call the tertiary center. And then you start to, trying to get somebody down to 401 when they're in early labor. You don't want that situation. So you have to get everybody sign on if you're going to deliver locally. It's somebody who's at intermediate risk. Low risk is usually less of a problem. Induction versus spontaneous delivery for inter, to a high risk patient we will probably induce at term. There's no really no indication of, cardiac indication for induction before term. Uh, spontaneous delivery is preferred if you have low risk, but for the high risk patient, you want your team around, you want your CCU and your ICU people around, not during Hawaii time at two o'clock in the morning, okay? Then, then you sort of create uh, uh, uncertainty where you can avoid it. Now, the windows of vulnerability for pulmonary edema is the late second and third trimester. Remember going back to that graph that I show the uh, peaking of the cardiac output, well, that corresponds to their, your uh, vulnerability to pulmonary edema, and also in the early postpartum period, we talk about that redistribution. There's always a substrate precipitant, you know, what's going underlying it and what tip things over. And often arrhythmia and also PE can be a precipitant. Treatment is the same. Diuretics, slow the tachyarrhythmia, and then, pre and then be on the lookout for premature delivery. Typical scenario, patients come in on Thursday night with pulmonary edema, you're treating patients medically better, you start talking with your delivery team about delivering, uh, having an in induction on Monday, and the patient will deliver on Sunday night, okay? Well, that's happened more often than not. Tachyarrhythmia during pregnancy, it's you're vulnerable during the entire pregnancy and postpartum period. In our, in our this paper that's under review, we show that the spikes in tachyarrhythmia, it occurs differently than heart failure. Again, there's something, there's a substrate and there's a precipitant. So always think beyond just treating the patient. Now, uh, guidelines in 2015 from circulation from AHA, when you do a cardiac arrest on these patients, I hope you never have to, but in case you do, you have to move the gravi-uterus laterally, and hypoxemia develops very rapidly, so get your expert intubator to put the ET tube in, use the smaller size, and here's the most uh, contentious or the most shocking recommendation. If there's no ROS or return or spontaneous circulation by four minutes, you have to do a cesarean delivery because there actually are many case reports that the mom is successfully resuscitated only after the baby is out, okay? So what it means is that you, these patients uh, in our obstetrical uh, centers, there's actually is a special code procedure for when a, when a pregnant woman has a cardiac arrest. So these are things you might not want to look, think about too much on a Friday morning, but nevertheless. So these are the five finger management approach to pregnancy heart disease. And the last slide is on long-term risk. And this is the subject of our group presence, a research uh, 
uh, is that we you, we passed the point of looking at risk index. You can sort of move around all the factors until you want. I think it's, we sort of reached a ceiling of how much you can predict, uh, short of doing genetics and uh, biomarkers and everyone. Uh, and this is showing that if you have an adverse maternal cardiac event during pregnancy, the obstetric obstetricians are happy because the baby is delivered. But your job as a practitioner is not done because these patients are at increased risk. So they do need serial follow-up. And we have other data showing for some obstructive lesions, such as aortic stenosis, that if you have moderate or severe aortic stenosis, that your chance of needing aortic valve replacement is much higher if you go through pregnancy than if you did not. Difficult studies to do because pregnancy is, a, is almost a biological certainty, okay? Society uh, and, and patient preference is that most women that's a pre reproductive age will cont contemplate pregnancy at some point in time and most will attempt it and most will be successful. That's life, and so to have a control group is very difficult. So takeaway point number three, get a cardiac, maternal cardiac assessment. We do a team approach. And so the conclusions, what are the three points to take away? Remember that the normal pregnancy is a hyperdynamic state, that you have a choice of stratification, and that low risk does not mean no risk and then think about early referral to a maternal cardiac clinic to management. And I have two seconds. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Su. And as a reminder, our three speakers will be returning to the podium uh, at the end of this session to take questions. Uh, now, both of our speakers so far ha have been at a later stage in their career, if I, could, if I could put it that way, and we're delighted to have them.